Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And I'm Charlotte Kramer, an undergraduate here at Stanford. And we have with us today Professor John Krosnick. Uh, John is a professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. He's, he's also a professor in the psychology department the Political Science Department, and the Department of Communications here at Stanford. So, John, welcome. Great having you. Bill, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. And uh, we just had a conference on human behavior and environmental sustainability that you chaired, John, and you brought in an all-star cast. And, and Charlotte, you were there. What were your uh, takeaways? I think my first impression going into the conference and really taking off the name from the conference, human behavior and sustainability. I was like, well, that's that's everything, really. I think human behavior, for me, it seems like the root of the issue in all of this. It's how do we change the way that we do things, you know, on a day-to-day -day level? How do we change ourselves for the sake of sustainability? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was really reflected in the conference. We had topics on sort of every range of social sciences, every range of human behavior from solar panel subsidies to deliberative polling and the environment. It was really, it was really a wide range of things. And that, I don't know, I haven't seen that in previous conferences. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, well, you know, Bill's assignment to me in putting this conference together was to, uh, in, in whatever way I wanted to, uh, bring in the social sciences to address issues of sustainability. And I decided to be a little bit ambitious in doing it in the sense that, you know, I could have invited 20 friends to come give talks and that would have been interesting and fine. But we're in the middle of building a community on this campus that with the Door School being new and just born, we are trying to uh, attract a, a coherent group of scholars who have been on the same campus for a while, but who haven't been a team yet. And um, to become a team, you know, you can have snacks together at receptions, you can listen to talks together, but really um, it, to hear each other's work is really important. And so Bill, in fact, in creating our department um, a year ago, started a series of talks where the core faculty were presenting our research to each other. And my goal was to kind of grab the many people on campus who should have been in that room and who are really doing social science work, but who, for whatever reason, hadn't yet chosen to affiliate with the Dora School. And so I just did work, work, work online to find all these people and invite them all to come. And I will tell you that the staff who organized the conference thought, this is a lot of people and it's not, not a lot of time for the talks. And is this, should we do this? But I think in the end, it, it worked out wonderfully because um, 15 minutes was just about perfect for everybody to present the breadth of ideas that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Did any big surprises come out of this, uh, in your opinion, John? I, I hate to say this is a surprise, but I, I really was thoroughly knocked out by the quality of our colleagues and the quality of the presentations in 15 minutes, because you know, it's hard to take a big issue and compact it into a little presentation in a way that a broad audience can capture. And that this is political scientists and public health people and psychologists and sociologists and people from law and people from the business school that, you know, to present technical work in a way that that broad group can understand and engage in and walk away excited about. That's a it's a challenge. And the what's people an example? Well, you know, one example is um one of the we had three professors come in from UC San Diego just by coincidence. These were people who proposed to come and were available and fit the schedule. And one of them was a woman named Alexandra Heaney, who talked about uh, her research on valley fever. So uh, she's uh, the kind of scholar who study, and I think you heard that, Charlotte, that the that she's the kind of scholar who is studying um, how the climate is changing, observable health-related phenomena. And in this case, valley fever is uh, a new, rapidly escalating health threat in the Central Valley of California and elsewhere. And people who are at risk, especially farmers in those dusty areas, don't know about the risk. And um, the question is, how do you educate a community that is focused on doing their work, and their work is in the high-risk setting. And so her research is trying to understand how uh, the cycles of climate change-related weather patterns 
cause increases and decreases in risk so that when you're trying to communicate about that risk to people, you're not saying all day, every day, you should be, don't go out and breathe, you know, because that doesn't work. And that was, it was so interesting to me as well to see how we could use climate data to predict such measurable health trends and just how it was the perfect case study of the interconnectedness of, you know, land and people, health and environment. So I thought that was a fascinating talk. And I think as well to your earlier point, this conference and the way that the conference itself was set up is for me such a perfect example of the way that we need to approach this issue, like as, you know, one world, as one sort of collection of people who all need to get into the same room and need to be talking about the same things. Because if we don't look at the farmers that are getting valley fever, if we don't look at the broader issues like voting and subsidizing and all of those things, if we don't if we don't look at all of it, then how do we solve it? So having something that was so wide and broad for me, I think it's it gave me as you know, a young person, as someone part of the next generation, a little bit of hope. So it was like, wow, the old guys really are getting in one room and they're talking about it. You know, <laughs> you know no I love, offense. I love it. It's okay. I love, I love hearing you, you say that, Charlotte. Of course, you, you and I met uh, when you were a student in my in my class when you were a freshman. So I, um, and and what I love about uh, the way you put that and and the example you brought up, John, is that. Uh, these are uh, this particular example of, of valley fever is something that we might not have seen if we were focusing only on sustainability issues as they occur in the big urban areas and and places we often uh, focus. Were there were there any other uh, uh, interesting surprises coming out of the research? Well, another example, I don't mean to overly focus on health here, but Desiree LeBeau, who is on our medical school faculty, again, somebody who you know could be very central to our group, and I hope will be, um, it talked about mosquitoes and the fact that climate change is causing increases in the threat of mosquitoes. And she actually said mosquitoes are the most dangerous uh, species on the planet to humans, and that um, her research focused in Grenada um, is devoted to, in for example, uh, field experiments in school settings there, where kids in some in the treatment schools, so to speak, were taught to become warriors to eliminate mosquitoes, and so they found, uh, you know, went, went around their town and found. Uh, wherever there was standing water, which is what the mosquitoes need to grow, and eliminate that. And these little kids didn't have that mission, but they became, um, you know, part of the troops to do this. And she could show not only that they eliminated lots of plastic that was sitting around accumulating water, but they actually reduced the rates of mosquitoes in those places. And so, again, when you think about people in need, you know, the, it's sort of the, the wealthy and developing countries that are pumping out CO2. And here the health professionals are zooming into places at risk and intervening in constructive ways. Boy, the example of mosquitoes is, is, uh, is pertinent, too, because of the obviously the diseases that are transmitted, uh, dengue and others transmitted that way. And it, it, I was unable to attend your conference. And at the time you were talking about mosquitoes, I was in DACA being eaten alive <laughs> by mosquitoes. And I, I can remember really being concerned, you know, at, at the time I was doing some research there. So it, it, uh, um, it, it's it's certainly pertinent. And for those of you uh, at home listening, if you're interested in more of these human health um, uh, examples, come on the uh, uh, website of the Stanford Initiative for Business and Environmental Sustainability, and you'll see the conference coming up that will be chaired by Desiree. And uh, it'll be all on human health and uh, and sustainability coming up in a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, so, Charlotte, uh, uh, were there other papers that you came away wanting to, to talk about? Um, something which because I've gone to all of these conferences now, and something which I've sort of been seeing time and time again is climate change and impacts on mental health, which, you know, I saw it in when we talked about the Watershed Restoration Conference about how climate change related to watersheds was impacting the mental health of Native Americans. And then here again, we had a paper on um, by Deborah Safer addressing mental health impacts of climate change. And it's just a theme that I'm seeing again and again. And 
I think I definitely want to learn more about it and I want to see more work on it. What were the big mental health issues they brought up in this paper? So one of the interesting questions that somebody brought up from the field um, during the, the discussion of the paper was, I mean, don't we have like lots of depression and lots of anxiety, all kinds of yeah. sources of that, you know, in, in daily life, it's just like part of being human. And, you know, the response to that is, yeah, but we've just created this huge elephant, which is causing that persistent, not disappearing threat for a large number of people for a long period of time. And to ignore the mental health consequences of that is at our own peril. And I think it's something that is especially important for young people because we really, we look at the world and we're kind of hopeless. I mean, that's how Bill and I met. I emailed him saying that I was hopeless about the world and I thought this class was just not going to help and I wanted some encouragement. And that's something that I see everywhere. There are so many people that just don't work on climate change because they're too depressed about the whole situation to work on climate change. You know, I've felt it. I know my friends have felt it. I'm assuming a lot of people feel it. So, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in fact, it, uh, along those lines, if, if I could call on your deep expertise, John. So obviously you're a, a famous psychologist. And uh, one question I've always wanted to ask you, um, <laughs> Charlotte's heard me on this before. I, I I notice a lot of people want to deal with the daunting nature of what we're dealing with here with, with climate change and, and sustainability uh, by asking for good news or, or maybe wanting to screen what they hear, which I guess makes some sense. I, I try not to watch the television news too much because how much war can I take or whatever. But of course, if I don't hear that the climate is changing, doesn't mean the climate isn't changing. It just means I'm not. I'm, I've got my head in a in a in a in a hole, right? And what I've noticed, just personally, is that my own movement into sustainability as a scholar, because I wasn't I wasn't always in this area, has made me feel more informed, but at the same time more empowered. I'm actually doing something now. Look, I'm not kidding myself. I'm not solving the problem, but I am doing something, right? I'm bringing smart people like you guys together to talk about it. I'm trying to teach class, whatever. Okay. But, but I'm wondering how much does doing something help our mental health, even though it exposes us to more bad news? Yeah. You know, it's a great question. And Gabrielle Wong Prati, our colleague actually gave a talk at the conference that's a little bit related to this. And let me, it's a little bit of a, takes a minute to get there. Sure. So let me explain. So her um, study was um, a, a longitudinal study of um, people along the Gulf Coast, um, recontacting them multiple times to check in with their thinking and their behavior. And one of the things that um, she found was that people who perceived themselves to be most at risk for climate change related bad weather attacks, we could call them, or events. So, so um, this is the Gulf of Mexico. Right, the, exactly. Where Texas, so many of the big uh, hurricanes have come. Exactly. In. So people who saw themselves at most risk, then uh, I think maybe you know due to her intervention in part, um, took steps to reduce their risk, to protect their house against flooding, to you know do other things that they could do to, if there were to be bad weather events, to protect their belongings and their, their persons. And um, what is ironic about this is that after they took those steps to fortify their houses and so on, and she recontacted them, they said, yeah, I think I'm at less risk now. Um, and this was a good thing in a way, because it's true, they were at less risk. But then her uh, view of this was that it reduced their motivation to actually do more to protect themselves. Like, I'm fine now, so everything's okay. Uh, you know, I got new windshield wipers. I don't need to change the tires. And, uh, you know, it's uh, so there's an irony to the dangers of taking self-protective steps. And so the, it's the same thing in the arena you're talking about that, you know, I know people, you know, people, you are a person who just says, I can't take this news anymore. I got to stop reading the New York Times for a while. It's too stressful to, to read this. And um, then you feel better and you feel less threatened. 
Um, but at some point, you know, you kind of can't live in the society without running into other people who are reading The New York Times and telling you. And so, OK, you take a break for a while and then at some point you can come back. But, you know, I agree completely that none of us is going to solve this problem, but we can all do our own small parts to try to contribute to larger solutions in just the way, Charlotte, you're talking about where you, you focus on one effect at a time, whether you're, you know, mental health or mosquitoes or uh, valley fever, whatever that is. And if, again, if we have an army of people doing lots of different things, um, you know, they, the, <clears throat> I'll tell you an important moment for me in this whole drama was maybe about 10 or more years ago when I, so I, I've been at Stanford for 20 years and I was interacting with the Woods Institute people early on, which was the real center at that point of this kind of stuff and listening to the natural scientists and, and the, the stories about climate. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of focus in the surveys that I do and in um, discussion about mitigation of climate change. Let's reduce emissions. Let's reduce future warming. And at some point, Buzz Thompson, who is a lawyer and spoke at, at our conference, uh, you know, said to me in some conversation, you know, you, you need to understand that we're, we're past the point of no return, that, you know, there, the climate, there, there's so much CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions out there that, you know, we, we are going to experience warming. It's going to be dramatic. We're going to see... Um, the, all of the undesirable consequences of it. And so, you know, kind of shifting into that mode and realizing, okay, you know, we have as a planet, we have cancer or whatever that is. But, you know, lots of people come through cancer successfully. And so it's it's a big challenge, but we got to take it on and, and try to deal with it. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's interesting that you say that because it means that the, the generation to come will be taking us to a... a really a very new and different and different world. What What's your reaction to this, Charlotte? I think I can understand turning off the news and trying to, you know, bury your hand, head in the sand. But I feel like my greatest struggle with, you know, working towards solutions for climate change stems from guilt that I have. Like, I feel guilty because I live in Luxembourg in Europe. And every year I you know, pack my bags and I fly all the way over to California. And then I'm here and I order food from, you know, Brazil or something. And then I go for Chinese and then, you know, spring break, like Cabo, here I come. Like, how do I reconcile being young and living my life and doing, you know, what my generation is doing with caring about the climate? How do I say, you know, I care about the climate and then do all of these things. Yeah, as a, as a, as all of us as consumers. So, I often use the term. I don't know if it's broadly used, but I often think of it as kind of environmental consumerism. If we think about consumerism through an environmental lens, we we all do need to take action. It it is also true the, the literature on this that environmental consumerism is probably not enough. We also need to act as environmental producers, if you will. So, so uh, uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be taking action to reduce our carbon footprint, but we also have to try to do things to, to change the way our productive activities yeah. Use yeah. um, and there, you know, the the innovations that that we see. You know, if you think about the innovations taking place. You, know, you talk about Luxembourg. We're seeing innovations with respect to alternative fuels for transportation and so forth that that ultimately in the long run will will make it possible for that kind of travel that you're talking about at a much reduced carbon We're footprint. writing a case study uh, on it right now. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so. well, that's right. That's actually for my class, if I remember. Yep. So, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That's right. So look, uh, I want to make sure we don't get out of this podcast without you, John, having the last word. And so just in terms of, of everything that went on at the conference, anything else you'd like to be able to bring to our audience's attention? Um, I, I think the, the final word I can say about this conference is that with the just the, the talent and energy and productivity on this faculty, that there's no shortage of inspiration from watching this work. And, you know, you can read Stanford Report. You can, there are ways to track what faculty are doing. But, you know, if you're looking for something to do, um, go online, look up the faculty who are doing this kind of work and read about the work. You'll be impressed and inspired and, and hopeful, I think. Maybe that's a way to contradict your feelings of guilt. I love that. Well, John Krosnick, thank you so much. 
Uh, Charlotte, thank you so much for yet another uh, great episode on our podcast. And to the listeners at home, until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.